Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we have a great uh, presentation for you today. Um, our speakers today, Dr. John Abow, the Associate Director for Research and Methodology um, and Chief Scientist at the U.S. Census Bureau, and also Dr. Lauren Scott Griffin, uh, Product Engineer and GIS Analyst uh, in Spatial Statistics here at ESRI for, for many, many years. Um, a couple of house rules before we begin. Um, we will open it up for Q&A at the end. Uh, so as you're listening along, please, if you have questions, you can put them into the, the questions window. We'll be monitoring that throughout the, the conversation and, and we'll throw it open uh, after the presentation for your questions. Um, with that, just a brief introduction. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Abowd is the uh, director, Associate Director for Research and Methodology. Um, he was named to the position in June of 2016 and the Research and Methodology Directorate leads critical work to modernize the operations and products of the Census Bureau. He's leading the agency's efforts to create a differentially private protection system for the 2020 Census and future data products as well. Uh, Dr. Lauren Griffin has more than 30 years of experience with ESRI in software development, spatial analysis, and GIS. She currently works as the product specialist on the geoprocessing and analysis team, where she's responsible for software support, education, documentation, and development. So you see we've got a couple of really good experts with us today. So just a couple of things uh, to set the stage for what we're going to discuss today. Uh, we're going to start out with a little bit of what is differential privacy. We want to get us all on the same page, right? So what are our basic understandings and definitions and how differential privacy might impact your work? Uh, then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Abow to uh, talk about the U.S. Census Bureau's disclosure avoidance system. Following that, uh, Dr. Scott Griffin will lead us through a discussion with Dr. Abow on some of the key issues. The Census Bureau requirements have a constitutional mandate to enumerate the U.S. population every 10 years. I think we all know this. But Title 13 also protects individuals from being identified in published data. Now, those two things are both very important and they're complex on their own, but when you put them together, they're actually in, in conflict with one another. It's a, a very difficult challenge. And in disclosure avoidance, in prior census, various forms of disclosure were used. And there's a lot of documentation online that you can go find about that. And of course, this is to ensure that the privacy is protected while also releasing high quality data. There were different methods used, such as data swapping and table suppression. And many of you are probably familiar with those. This round, when we start to look at differential privacy, we have to understand what that means. It is a formal privacy approach that provides the mathematical privacy assurances by adding in uncertainty or noise into the release data. And with differential privacy, the accepted risk can be quantified through a measure called epsilon. And I'll let uh, John will talk about that, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but the Census Bureau will determine the amount of noise that's necessary to balance this privacy loss and accuracy for each of the tables that are used. Now, that's not all there is to it, right? Uh, we have a disclosure avoidance system as well. So if it were okay to have negative values or fractions, everything would be fine. Um, but because those are really not acceptable and because smaller geographies need to add up to larger geographies, the Census Bureau does some post-processing as well. So together, differential privacy and post-processing are referred to as the disclosure avoidance system. Now, just a couple of more things to set a little context for us. I think that the biggest question uh, all of us as geographers or, or analysts probably have is, you know, at what level of geography will the summary files be released? But there's a lot of other things we need to be thinking about. Uh, we need to be thinking about accuracy of data, the impact on small areas, tracking marginalized populations, temporal analysis, right? How do we do those longitudinal studies? And um, even, you know, what's next? What other products um, will be uh, look, looking at with differential privacy? An example um, here is in thinking about spatial patterns. What is being done to ensure that modifications to the data won't change the underlying spatial pattern? Here we're looking at seniors in a, in a given location around San Diego. 
And um, in the diagram you can see on the left, we've got the summary table SF1 and then uh, the differential privacy. And you can see just visually that there are some, some, some differences there. So what does this mean to our work? So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. About. I'm, I'm happy to drive slides for you, uh, John, and um, please walk us through. All right. Um, according to my clock, it's still good morning, everyone. So good morning, everyone. And um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I want to note for the record that when I give talks like this, I'm speaking for myself and not the U.S. Census Bureau. All right. I don't uh, want to belabor this slide because um, it was just summarized for you quite effectively. The Census Bureau has a dual mandate. It has to publish quality statistics about the U.S. population and economy, and it has to ensure that the responses provided by anyone in the confidential data cannot be identified by uh, from our publications. And as was noted, these are competing um, obligations. I also uh, don't want to revisit the Census Bureau's decision, uh, but I will um, summarize it for you here. We determined that current computing capability and current software made database reconstruction and resulting record linkage re-identification attacks feasible and, um, and harmful using the existing disclosure avoidance technologies, primarily the swapping technology that was used in 2010 and in 2000 and 1990. Uh, essentially, the traditional disclosure avoidance methods are insufficient to counter these risks. Uh, in the language of government agencies, that turned the risk into an issue. That is to say, something that has occurred with probability one and therefore has to be mitigated immediately. So the mitigation is to move to modern systems which are uh, algorithmically based to provide the, the confidentiality protection and, um, and to do it on the 2020 census. The massive silver lining of this is that we have brought privacy protection and statistical agencies out of the shadows or the back office we don't have to rely on secrecy and obfuscation to uh, protect the confidentiality of the underlying microdata. We can say exactly what it is we intend to do, exactly what the parameters are in that system, and exactly how they were applied to the underlying confidential data without compromising the confidentiality protection, uh, which has enabled empowering all of you to be our partners in tuning it. And I just want to say, in case there's any doubt left in anyone's mind, we welcome this partnership. We acknowledge that the system needs to be tuned, and uh, we will continue to do so until we press go um, in, in production. So nothing about the technology's implementation prevents tuning right down to the last minute. Some decisions need to be made a bit earlier, but they are essentially locked in right now, so that's uh, uh, it's not that big a deal, the ones that have to be made sooner rather than later, but I'll talk about them. All right, so, so we can have this conversation and be extremely specific precisely because we've moved to modern methods where the, the protection is by mathematical proof rather than by uh, obfuscation. And I also want to point out that the Census Bureau is not an amateur at this. The graph that's in front of you is our um, graphical user interface to uh, examine workplace location and residences for all the workers in the United States. This is the 2017 data, the latest data that have been uh, disseminated. The application goes back to 2002. The application maps jobs all the way to a block and it maps the residential location of the employee all the way to the block so it allows you to build arbitrary geographic areas that are based on census block technology. And uh, this particular uh, one is one I'm fond of using in talks. So that is Ithaca, New York, where I lived for uh, 29 years. 
And uh, uh, since I'm not controlling the pointer, I can't point right to where I used to live, but it's actually a dot on this, uh, on, on this uh, map, uh, not because uh, uh, it's my house, but because that happens to be the uh, interior point of the block is close enough to where I lived uh, that, uh, that uh, it points to it. That, but that heat map that you're seeing is showing the, uh, the residential locations of everybody who works inside the orange area, which is the uh, Ithaca, New York uh, core-based statistical area. There's a distance direction map in the upper right-hand corner. That distance direction map was tuned for accuracy based on um, distance and radius for tract level observations. So the accuracy tuning was for uh, geographic areas that are approximately the size of the tract. Uh, and it uh, uses different privacy on the residential side. It was deployed in between 2008 and 2010. These, uh, these changes were um, integrated into it. It was the first differentially private uh, deployment of a production data product in the world. And it's been run, uh, we think, reasonably successfully uh, since then. For, so that's more than a decade. It is a part of on the map for, for emergency management, which FEMA uses along with overlaid weather and other natural disaster data to uh, determine which businesses are being disrupted, which commute patterns are being disrupted, where the people live and work who are uh, likely to be in the path of a hurricane or um, uh, other uh, features. So, so uh, we're not amateurs and, and, um, and we weren't as transparent in this implementation as we could have been because the business data are not protected by formal privacy, uh, but that, that was the first differentially private deployment. All right, so I'm just gonna give a very high level summary of the top-down algorithm, TDA, because many people in the audience, I think, are already familiar with it, but also because uh, Lauren and I have been going over the Q&A, and, and it, it's clear that I'm already getting sophisticated questions from this audience, and it'd be better to just go right to them. So um, the key, features of the um, top-down algorithm are that it ingests the final census edited file, that is the one that has all of the geographic locations finalized and all of the characteristics in statistical terms completed. So it's either the response that was given or the uh, effects of our edit and imputation algorithms to generate those responses. It imposes all the structural zeros in the edit specs for the 2020 census and it imposes some data-dependent invariance, which we will probably talk about a bit later. In the processing, it takes that uh, census edited file, that CEPH, and it converts it to a different representation, but one that's very familiar to statisticians. Instead of being one record for every person or every housing unit in the population, it's one record for every unique combination of allowable values of the variables location, so that's the block GOID, sex, male or female, age and years, Hispanic ethnicity, uh, the 63 OMB race categories, and uh, a, a, a variable that shows whether you're in a group quarters or you're in a uh, uh, housing unit. If you're in a housing unit, it's your relationship to person one. If you're in a group quarters, it's your group quarters type. That's all. Those data are converted to the equivalent histogram. And then the table summaries that are specified in uh, the redistricting data, PL94171, and the detail, sorry, the demographic, um, demographic and housing characteristics file, DHC, so I'm used to the acronyms now that I don't expand them properly, DHC, those are uh, put in count query form, and those queries are actually measured using the uh, histogram version of the cell. And then the differentially private part of the algorithm operates to add noise. That noise comes from a symmetric geometric distribution, so it's integer values centered at zero and with dispersion that's determined by the allocation of the privacy loss budget to that particular query. Uh, parallel composition allows us to apply the same privacy loss budget to literally millions of queries, and uh, sequential composition um, applies when we add up the query sets at different geographic levels and across different tables in the DHC and redistricting uh, data products. 
Then comes converting that noisy histogram to microdata. That's a two-step optimization, two conceptual steps. First, it's converted to non-negative uh, values, and then it's converted to integers. The integer conversion satisfies all the adding up constraints that a table would satisfy, and so it can be expanded to microdata directly from that uh, conversion back to microdata. I will say, back in 2016, when the team accepted the assignment to ingest the CEPH and to output microdata that could be tabulated in the conventional way, the full, implement, the full implications of that uh, acceptance were not known to us. And, uh, that turns out, by many orders of magnitude, to be the hardest problem, and the one we are still working really hard to refine our solutions of. The DP part, I don't want to say it's uh, but simple, but it is basically uh, very straightforward. It is the requirement to use the conventional estimator, which is the tabulation system from the Census Bureau, to produce statistics in their conventional tabulated form that is the monumental lift. Um, that said, that's what we have implemented. So the, the schema, which has an example on the right, I've just shown you, and basically using estimates for the 2020 census, we're taking differentially private measurements on approximately 8 million times 125, 1.25 million data items. So that's several billion differentially private measurements that feed this optimization problem that results in a microdata file that's recognizable. And indeed, we've released one now. Uh, the public versions are called privacy protected uh, microdata files, and they are the output of the complete 2020 DAS, DP plus post processing. So once the post processing is done, uh, internally it's called a microdata detail file, is sent off to tabulation to produce tables in the format that you're used to see. So, um, what do we mean by data dependent invariance? We mean properties that have to hold without any noise infusion. Uh, at the moment, they're listed here, and those are very likely to be the final ones, but that decision is not mine. It's uh, the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, and it will be made in September. So the state population totals are invariant, which means that the reapportionment re algorithm mandated by the 1941 Reapportionment Act will be applied directly to actual enumerations of state populations. In addition, because the number of housing units on each block and the number and type of group quarters facilities on each block, not their populations, just their number, with a few minor exceptions, but I'm not going to go into them, have been public since we started LUCA um, several years ago. Uh, we consider those operational data for running the census rather than uh, privacy protected inputs to our system. And so they're invariant uh, essentially because we've been um, communicating those numbers to partners across the United States in an effort to ensure that the master address file, the master address list used for the enumeration are as accurate as they can be made. But the actual detrust, the details of the addresses in those blocks are not um, revealed. Those are confidential, and, uh, and so uh, those block. So those block counts are invariants, and as it turns out, though, that, those last two invariants there challenge the mathematics of getting out microdata because they uh, make it very difficult to prove that a solution exists. Uh, the team has worked extremely hard to only send to the optimizer problems with for which there's a proof that the answer can be computed in polynomial time. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, we have now released three different versions, sorry, two different versions of the code base. We'll release at least one more before we run for production, and we will release uh, the production one. Uh, what we now know, and what was clear from the beginning, is you can't have full privacy and full accuracy, but I've been saying that since 2016, so that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. We have prioritized the redistricting data down to the block level because of the statutory requirement that they be produced. And, uh, I think that's a difficult priority to argue with, so I'm happy to, uh, to um, discuss it. But uh, we have prioritized, and we have not modified the published format for those data. We've taken that as a constraint on the system. 
For the demographic and housing characteristics file, we have specified in those 1.25 million queries for persons and for the 1.025 million queries for housing units, the summary necessary to produce the tabular data that the uh, Census Bureau has announced will be included in the demographic and housing characteristics file. So this is how it works. Um, and I think probably a lot of you have seen this presentation. It works from a geographic hierarchy that starts at the US level. I see that I forgot to add uh, Epsilon Nat. Uh, that should be Epsilon US. There's a separate Epsilon for Puerto Rico. They have the same value, but the Puerto Rico and the United States are done separately. And then it goes to the state, and then it goes to the lower levels of the geographic hierarchy. I'm going to show you some examples of that in a second. So it does all the work at the national level, at the US level, to create that histogram needed to tabulate microdata, a national version of it. Then it takes the privacy loss budget assigned to state, and it does the same thing for the 51 states. So DC counts as a state for these purposes. Right? It imposes consistency in that everything done at the state level has to add up to its national equivalent when you sum over states. And then you just go down the geographic hierarchy and repeat this at every level until you get down to the block. The invariants are imposed at every point at which they, uh, they intervene, that is wherever they are, they're imposed, and they're just part of these consistency constraints that I noted under bullet three. Okay, I'm talking to uh, geographers and demographers, so I recognize a lot of names in the, in the attendee list, so I'm talking to a lot of demographers I know, but also a lot of geographers. I'm pretty sure all of you have seen this, and uh, thanks, Deirdre, I pulled this off of your uh, publication quality uh, charts internally yesterday to make sure I had the highest quality one you could get. So uh, it turns out we invented a new term we didn't mean to. Uh, the central axis of this geographic hierarchy is what we have been calling the spine, and I now have kind of semi-official permission to call it the spine. Um, it doesn't really matter what you call it. The key thing is that the top-down algorithm can only handle a hierarchy, it cannot handle a lattice. And so you need to put the geographic uh, subdivisions into a hierarchy, and the one that we have used is nation, state, counties, census tracts, block groups, and census blocks. And those of you who have had a close look at our uh, algorithm know that we inserted a level between counties and census tracts because of a technical problem called GANOP, but it's still in this hierarchy. There are lots of other hierarchies. They all end at census blocks, not because the census blocks are uh, deliberately used as the building blocks, but the, the census blocks are designed so that this feature that I'm about to describe will be true, that you can start there and assemble all of these other geographic areas. And the one I want to focus on for a second is um, voting districts, which, as you can see in the hierarchy, usually are pulled back to counties. Uh, there are some voting districts that are uh, pulled back to other things, like school districts, okay. and congressional districts, which are pulled back to states. Remember that the um, after total population, the application getting the most attention and for which this algorithm was designed is redistricting, which means that this particular set of off-spine geographies, voting districts, congressional districts, and similar things, which do use blocks as their input component and which are pulled back to political entities, usually counties, um, are inherently Here's another set, inherently not known today. They can't be on the spine. So what has to happen is that the algorithm has to deliver statistical accuracy for arbitrary voting districts, arbitrary congressional districts, arbitrary legislative districts for the state legislatures. Once you aggregate blocks, to arbitrary contiguous geographic entities of the same, of similar population. So that's what a voting district is, similar population. And we worked extremely hard to make that work, um, but it does advantage 
uh, geographies that are closer to the spine and slightly disadvantaged geographies that are farther off the spine. However, all of the target geographies, districts, voting districts, are off the spine. So it has to be accurate enough for arbitrary off-spine geographies that get pulled back to the spine at political units to work. All right, I want to show one more problem. Some high priority political entities are associated with the hierarchy of American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian areas. And there's essentially nothing between census blocks and these intermediate areas here, tribal census tracts, Oklahoma tribal statistical areas, I won't read them all, and the, the nation. So these are all off spine, but they are all focuses of attention to try to get both the population and the characteristics as accurate as possible. Things that improve the population estimates for these areas that don't do anything else reduce the accuracy of the statistics within the smaller areas. So but striking a compromise has caused us to focus attention on this particular off-spine geography to try to figure out how to engineer a solution for it that compromises population accuracy and statistical accuracy trading off against each other and then maintains an appropriate level of privacy protection. I'm not going to say that's an easy problem, uh, but um, quote, putting things on the spine does not necessarily solve that problem. It solves one part of it and it makes the other part of it worse. All right, as well as I think it's pretty clear now, uh, what it means to be accurate depends on uh, who you're talking about. So we are trying to deliver interpretable formal privacy guarantees under formal privacy loss budgets. That's the high level objective. The accuracy properties are affected both by that privacy loss allocation and by the algorithms themselves. Tuning the algorithms doesn't cost us anything in terms of privacy protection, so that's where a lot of the focus has been for the last six months. Distinct groups of users have particular analyses that they are focused on, and we recognize that, and uh, I think it's not an understatement to say they have been uh, extremely cooperative in drawing them to our attention. And we have paid attention. But tuning accuracy for one analysis comes at the expense of other analyses holding the privacy loss budget constant. Some things we can get by improving the algorithm. Some things can only be obtained by moving the privacy loss budget around. It's not obvious how to optimize that privacy loss budget because there's no easy way to weight the different interest groups here. And um, just need to acknowledge that. And, uh, say that it's a hard problem and the first wide-scale public discussions of how to address it are happening right now. Um, so I think that's really um, all I want to say about the DAS per se. I want to show you a little bit of evidence now of, of why you have to be careful about the algorithms. And I think it's slides that most of you have seen, but it's useful to do them one more time and then we'll get to the, to the specific questions. So this is what happens if you say, uh, do differential privacy, but don't design any optimization that focuses on having more accurate statistics as the number of people you're making inferences about increases. So these were, this was estimated on the 1940 public census data, and the equivalent of the lowest level geography is an enumeration district there, and there are counties, states, and nations. And this is from a very simple version of the algorithm that only has a 128 cell um, uh, query matrix. But if you apply the privacy loss protection at the lowest level of geography, which is the enumeration district, and then you compute all the statistics necessary for doing redistricting, this particular accuracy measure, all the other accuracy measures have the same feature here. The national data aren't any more accurate than the data for the enumeration districts. So no matter how many people are in the statistical area, the statistical accuracy, it happens to be pretty good here because there's only 128 queries uh, being analyzed. But the national data should be a lot better. They're based on the population in 1940. An enumeration district is about the size of a modern block group. This is what happens if you do the DP at the block group level and add everything up, or the block level and add everything up. 
it's what's called local differential privacy, or it's really the central differential privacy equivalent of local differential privacy. This is what the top-down algorithm was designed to do and does very effectively in this situation. As the number of people in the geographic entity being analyzed increases, the data go to approximately full accuracy. So they're essentially fully accurate for the nation. They're only um, very slightly off full accuracy at, at very low privacy loss budgets for states. They're even decent in the sense of accuracy above 0.99 for small privacy loss budgets for counties. The enumeration districts remain noisy because the enumeration districts are going to get noise and the protection in the lowest level of geography is the location protection in the system. It can't go away. So the algorithm does what it was designed to do, but as many people in the audience know, it created a lot of um, byproduct things it wasn't designed to do. And uh, as I've said, uh, people have been very generous in pointing them out to us and we have been uh, very aggressive in trying to address them. All right, so I've included the latest batches of technical resources here, and I think I'm ready for questions. That's great, John. Thank you so much. And I'm going to invite um, Dr. Griffin in now to drive us through uh, a set of Q&A. And uh, we got some questions from our users already, and uh, we had some of those in advance. So, uh, Lauren, please. Great, thanks, John. I know everyone watching really appreciates you taking the time to talk to us and to answer some of our questions. And the first question we have deals with accuracy. We're wondering how we might be able to determine if the 2020 data that we're using, say at the track level, or at the block group level, if it's accurate enough for a particular project or a particular use case. Do you have any recommendations or specific suggestions that might help us assess 2020 data accuracy. So um, I, I think many of um, the interested users are already doing what I'm about to suggest, but we released the initial demonstration data product in uh, last October. We just released a new one, and uh, I'm grateful to IPMS for putting it in tabular form for us. That's a very effective approach. Uh, and I have publicly committed to releasing another one before the September VSEP meeting. Many users are taking these applications on the 2010 data and rerunning their analyses. And we are deliberately doing them at a fixed level of the overall privacy loss budget so that uh, you can measure improvement. And so uh, we need to either have improvement acknowledged or not acknowledged. Either way is fine. Uh, you can also measure dispersion in the answer relative to the answer you would have gotten from the data in 2010, which were also noisy, but we've never given you any tools uh, to deal with that. There will be a version of the demonstration data products released after the final BAS parameters are set, so you'll be able to see exactly what those the implications would have been for 2010 data compared to uh, 2000. That should assist in comparisons back to the 2010 census. There are a number of tools that we're investigating that would allow analysts uh, to um, work with the official tabulations in a more sophisticated way than you've been able to work with them in the past and compute confidence intervals for them, for example. We haven't finalized which of those tools will be released, uh, but uh, in principle, the Census Bureau will do the lion's share of the computation and provide the tools for computing um, measures of uncertainty. That's essentially an obligation of a statistical agency now once it acknowledges uncertainty to provide tools that are needed to uh, accommodate it. Let me say mm -hmm. that we are trying to tune the official statistics so that things that are based on populations, you shouldn't have to worry about this. And uh, we will attempt to document how big the population needs to be before that statement uh, uh, applies at that. Making that statement precise involves a combination of probability modeling from the differential privacy and accuracy modeling from the post-processing that I'm not prepared to give the complete metric for now because you have to actually lock in the post-processing algorithms before you can um, standardize those metrics. But uh, we will do that, and it's important to do that and, and to acknowledge that the, the privacy protections, now that they're public, they need to be incorporated into people's analyses um, uh, and to assist in that. Great, thank you. That's good to know. Um, our next question is um, 
focuses on redistricting. And I want to know, John, what is your message to the redistricting in our audience or to people who are just wondering how the DAS uh, is going to impact the redistricting process? So let me say that making the data fit for use for redistricting has been, after population, is the highest priority use case since we started working on the problem in 2016. Um, it explains why we use the statistical central geographic spine, because that has the best chance of producing accuracy with the minimum amount of adjustment to the geographic areas, and because the geographic areas for redistricting can't be specified in advance. In terms of official population estimates, you'll be able to form districts that um, uh, that satisfy one person, one vote uh, criteria based on the official populations exactly as it's been done before. Nothing about the way the redistricting code works will break. In terms of um, Voting Rights Act enforcement, uh, the noise in the statistical measures of um, majority-minority districts will be explicitly acknowledged. We have been preparing a detailed report that will eventually be public uh, that uh, we have um, shared with the career attorneys in the voting rights section of the Department of Justice to get their feedback on that examines an additional suite of accuracy measures tuned to the redistricting application and to Voting Rights Act Section 2 scrutiny for them to look at and give us comments. They've given us comments now on two versions of those metrics, and we are incorporating their comments into our fitness for use analysis. Um, it's ultimately the Census Bureau's obligation alone to determine that the privacy protections are uh, sufficient. But it's the entire user community, and especially specialized users like redistrictors and the Department of Justice, to determine whether the data are fit for their intended use. Um, so I, I guess it's, I can acknowledge that we will not be surprised if there is some judicial scrutiny of this uh, format. And the public nature of the privacy protections supports that scrutiny. We won't have to speculate. We will be able to document them. Uh, I don't want to say, I, I, obviously I have no idea how that's going to play out. But, right. uh, but it, it is a, it's our obligation to do the best job we can to, to document fitness for use and to do the best job we can to protect uh, privacy and to acknowledge that there's an inherent trade-off um, uh, that we have to arbitrate on that trade-off. Thanks, John. The, this next question really gets at this tension between accuracy and privacy. And we're wondering if it's even possible to have accuracy or privacy for really small populations, small geographies, very specific race ethnicities, for example. And we're hoping that you can reassure us that the DAS system is going to perform as well for small geographies, for small population groups, for minority populations, for example, as it does for everyone else. So uh, let me acknowledge that that is a really hard, but that I, we do not consider small populations to be marginalized populations. And, uh, and so uh, let me kind of, go through a, a short list of use cases that, uh, that we need to keep in mind. There are some very explicit statutory uses of the population in um, relatively sparsely populated parts of the U.S., particularly certain uh, um, American Indian Alaska Native tribal areas. Those population statistics have to be fit for those, uh, for those statutory uses, and so that bumps that up into the category of getting the populations as accurate as the privacy loss budget will permit. Um, so that's a high priority. Some uses of our block level census data and block group level census data will need to be revised. And I'm thinking primarily of uh, homophily and heterogeneity indices, segregation indices that uh, are very popular in sociology, and I think you even showed me a few in geospatial analysis. Uh, those were always noisy, and, uh, and when people use the American Community Survey and the block group data, they acknowledge that noise and deal with the margins of error. Uh, they will now have to deal with the margins of error at the, at the block level, and at the 
block group level, depending on the or the track level, depending on the level of aggregation they do those statistics over. That's a well understood problem in statistics, and uh, the first tool that will be available is our aids to computing margins of error for functions of the official statistics, and then other tools may become available that we can talk about later if there's more time. Okay. So, Linda, do we have time for one more? Do you want to open it to the user questions? I think we have time for, for one more here, and then we've got some user questions coming in. Okay, great. So, GIS, as GIS analysts, we're always going to be interested in analyzing our data over space and time. And we're wondering, with the changes to the 2020 census data, is it still going to be reasonable, valid to do longitudinal analyses? Would it be valid to compare 2020 data to 2000? and 10 data, for example, to understand trends? Uh, yeah, depending on the size of the population you're doing the trend for, you may have to account for some margin of error in the, in the 2020 data that you wouldn't have accounted for in 2010. Not that it wasn't there, but you couldn't account for it. Uh, and and um, I'm sure there will be very creative people thinking about how to use the final demonstration data product run at the actual settings of the 2020 DAS on the 2010 census uh, to assist in that as well. I haven't thought very hard about that particular aspect of it. Okay, so we're, we'll play with the demonstration data and see what happens. Well, no, I would say that. I said that, that uh, you will be able to do a straight comparison to the official 2010 census, but you should take account of the uh, margin of uncertainty in the 2020 data, which will be a function of how big a group it is we're trying to compare the trend for. Thank you. All right, we're going to open it up now, and we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to get the first one for you coming to us from Doug Johnson. Um, he says, now that COVID-19 is nearly certain to force record high use of imputation to fill in census responses, is differential privacy even still needed? Won't the widespread use of imputation introduce sufficient randomness to provide privacy? So first of all, I can't comment on whether or not uh, I think the um, imputation rate is likely to rise. Uh, the Census Bureau is committed to running the full non-response follow-up operation. We, we every week announce, in effect, the um, current status of those operations, which are basically the on-the-fly modifications to the original design that the, that the pandemic has engendered. So, so I, I don't want, and I won't, speculate on that. I will say that it's a common misperception in the, um, in the community that uh, statistical inference in edit imputation is a substitute for confidentiality protection. It's not. To, completely support that statement, we need to go down a path which would deprive other people of the opportunity to ask other questions. Essentially, you have to protect the confidential data. And if you back the differential privacy up to the census unedited file, then you have to protect all those added imputation steps, which are essentially reusing other people's confidential data. And so uh, the methods by which you reuse them expose uh, at real census records, uh, so there is no confidentiality protection in edit and imputation procedures. That is a commonly held myth. I'm going to move on to the next one. This is coming to us from Gwen. Um, now that court decisions have been made reaffirming that much of Oklahoma is tribal land, how is census amending plans for those tabulations? Uh, that's outside my area of expertise, but I think there might be some people in the audience, if you want to mute them, can answer it. Um, I don't think I can do that now. So maybe what we'll do, John, we'll park that uh, because I don't think we're going to get to all the questions we're getting, but we will um, put together a, a FAQ afterwards with the answers to uh, my answer all to that the questions. Question is the tribal geographies are delivered to us as a consequence of careful research done in the geography division and the Geography Division works carefully with our um, official tribal uh, consultations. Um, uh, I don't want to say we get that right, but we definitely go through a very formal and very careful process to have those definitions reflect the agreed upon definitions of the tribal areas. And uh, the DAS does nothing to modify that. Okay. 
All right, let's let's move on. Uh, next question coming to us from Wendy. Does your answer about one person, one vote being easy to meet mean the population will be based on as reported census block data? No, what I said is the official population numbers will be the ones that are in the official statistics and they can enter the computer programs the same way they did before. There has always been uncertainty about those population numbers and they are still treated as official and processed. Um, short question from Kevin. Will a margin of error be supplied with tabulated census 2010 data? I'm not sure I understand the question. If you and mean maybe, historical maybe he meant 2020 data. <laughs> If you met 2020, we accept the obligation to quantify the uh, measures of uncertainty. We have not finalized how we will be able to do that, and we may not be able to deliver more than um, guidance charts at the official publication dates. But we will continue to work on that until the tools are in the public domain. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next question is from Jay Jun Lee. Uh, does the Bureau evaluate the 2020 DAS using certain redistricting use cases? And if so, which use cases do you use and why? So the, the full set of redistricting use case metrics that we've been using uh, are being incorporated into our uh, public metrics, but they aren't there yet. Uh, there is a bit of, there's a bit of, um, they're not as easy to incorporate into our public metrics because our public metrics are based on variation essentially from geographic levels and population sizes. And the set we developed for evaluating the um, redistricting use case is based on the actual statistical variation that occurs from a full run of the DAS, so simulation-based rather than uh, geographic uh, variation-based. So um, but the, the, the two teams are coordinating the simulation-based ones were developed before we made the public commitment to release large numbers of uh, metrics, and the simulation-based ones are harder to develop public versions for. So uh, we we are going through the process of, uh, of um, essentially getting a pro protocol for that and, and getting them pushed into the public domain. But yes, they will be public. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see, next question coming in from Scott. Uh, are there any publications available online that describe the implementation changes made in the most current release? There are no publications online to do that yet. Okay, but coming. Here's yeah. the personnel management problem. There is a fixed team that can either do it or write about it. Um, there are not, there's not a separate, a separate team that's come up through the ranks that has been trained to write about it. So the, the, the writing about it and the code base releases have always trailed, um, often by a significant amount. I understand that there, at some point they have to catch up, but uh, this is not unusual in the development of data products at the Census Bureau's. Okay, a couple more here. Um, can you explain in more detail what you mean when you say the PL94-171 data is prioritized? I am saying that the commitment to publish the redistricting data exactly the way they were um, confirmed in the Federal Register notices, public discussion, responses to the public discussion, and the posted final layout, which was also the layout of the 2018 end-to-end -end census test demonstration data, uh, we are committed to making that official statistical publication fit for the use of redistricting and Voting Rights Act Section 2 scrutiny. Voting Rights Act Section 2 scrutiny. Okay, let's see, one from Francis Jones. Why does U.S. Census Bureau prefer pre-tabular rather than post-tabular methods of disclosure control for census data? Um, if you can get the asker to define the terms, uh, I don't, I'm not sure I understand them the same way they were asked. Yeah, if Francis, if you're still online, if you can clarify your question in the window, perhaps that would be helpful. Um, while we're waiting for that, I'm going to grab another question. This one from uh, Leon. Uh, regarding the trade between accuracy and privacy of data, what methods do you use to evaluate the data quality? So we've been, we 
got a large team that combines uh, experts from a variety of disciplines is coordinated in the demographics director by Jason Devine that has been assembling uh, the use cases and the uh, accuracy metrics associated with those use cases. The team uh, doing redistricting is in uh, research and methodology, but those two teams are now coordinated as well. Um, uh, those, the, the, the general use case metrics are public and we have released uh, the set of detailed metrics that we uh, ran on the, on the original demonstration data product and uh, the same set of metrics that we ran on the May 27th, 2020 version of the demonstration data product. We are tuning to those metrics, uh, but those metrics do not speak with one voice. So we have also released, uh, and it was released on June 1st in the CNSTAT uh, expert group, comparisons of, in this case, it was uh, 10 different uh, post-processing algorithms with the, the sets of algorithms held constant and the allocations of the privacy loss budget varied across them. And we showed the effects on um, a fairly large subset of the detailed summary metrics. So you could see uh, why the one that was used for the next demonstration data product, where it fit. You know, it was in the middle, but that, that's not that's not going to be a surprise to anybody. And it, um, exactly how it was in the middle is documented in that presentation. That's what we have put in the public domain. Uh, today. Okay. All right. We'll take one one last question here. Will the replacement for SF1 be released at the block and block group level? That is the current plan. Um, the user community has recognized that that is an expensive allocation of privacy loss budget and has asked us to experiment with what would happen if we de-emphasize the block group and block tabulations from, uh, so, so I, when I say the, the demographic and housing characteristics, I'm just let me just exclude the redistricting data. When they're published, they're generally brought in and given new table numbers, and it's one set, so you go to the same place. But it's, it's convenient here to distinguish the PL94171 table summaries from the rest. And so when I say DHC, I just mean the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the rest, to see what would happen if the uh, summaries were not taken below the track level, uh, the way that is implemented in experiments doesn't actually remove them from the code base. It just massively reduces the privacy loss budget, which would then be accompanied with something like a statement. We don't believe that this particular table is fit for use in its current form. You might want to combine it with other tables. We have, none of that language is final. I don't want people uh, speculating. It is, it, this suggestion comes from the external user community, uh, and in good faith, we are examining it, but no, con no conclusions have been drawn, and the structure of those experiments hasn't been exposed even to the expert group. That's great. That's great. Um, I'm going to just put up a, a slide here quickly as, as we move to the end um, with some resources for all of you. So again, uh, we have been recording the presentation today. We will make the recording available afterwards, but there's a lot of good links in here uh, for resources, some, some of which John has referenced throughout the talk today. Um, Esri has also published some uh, methodology uh, around ACS, right? This isn't the first time we've gone through changes with, with census methods um, and some other resources as well. Um, so I really want to um, throw it back with a, a closing challenge and, and Lauren, uh, frankly, was the one that, that threw this question out the other day. Um, you know, what are we willing to give up in order to gain accuracy, right? This is, this is a, a big discussion. And I think the challenge for us in the geographic community is to think about, are there some tools or methods that we could put forward um, to help us better understand the noisy da uh, data, right, and the patterns underneath that. So we do want to hear from you as well. Um, and hear your thoughts and hear your questions. So when, when you download this uh, presentation, the recording, the link in there will take you to a chat and GeoNet. We want to hear back from you on, on what your concerns are on privacy versus accuracy. Um, Lauren, any, any last uh, thoughts or comments from you? No, just that we really appreciate your time, John, and I'm sure there'll be more questions coming up through the GeoNet chat, and we look forward to responding to those. Thank you, Linda, too, for all that you've done to make this happen. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, Dr. Abab, thank you so much. Any closing comments from you, sir? I just wanted to thank both of you uh, for uh, working with me. 
and, uh, and thank the S3 community for participating here and uh, acknowledge that I will participate in answering the questions that uh, come in here at AQ. We'll probably use a larger group than just me, which is more efficient, but uh, we are trying to get answers into the hands of dedicated users. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to call it a wrap, and uh, hope you all have a good day, and everyone stay healthy and safe out there.